you actually recently wrote an article kind of addressing the church and the way that the church um, has historically and, and currently approached sexuality. Um, and, you know, this article is called Break the Silence. Um, and you just wrote this really eloquent article. And I would just love to chat with you about how this article came about and why you decided to write it. Mm-hmm. Well, as I have been um, pursuing this my career professionally, working with couples, sitting down with couples, more and more just, um, I would sit with couples that struggled sexually, you know, just rarely do I have a couple that come in in marital conflict. Is there not an issue around the sexual part of their relationship? And so as I grew my education around that, just kind of really recognizing, um, just where the church could be more helpful. And so I don't, I don't want this article to be perceived as me blaming or, or accusing or pointing my finger at the church, but to just, we can be helpful. We can be more helpful than what we have been historically. And, you know, to be able to really recognize that there are hurting people within Mm -hmm. our church. And, and I don't really believe that um, the church is silent, you know, you know, to be, um, to be hateful or to be mean around this, or I really do think it's fear of being misunderstood or not knowing all of the answers or really, um, cause there, there's just, there's, it's so broad. There's so many sexual struggles that we have. And so, um, I think it's just kind of fear that the church hasn't addressed all of these, but so as I've, as I've grown in my profession and sitting with couples and grown in my education, um, I really have felt this, you know, this catch in my spirit of, well, you probably should, ought, you know, you probably ought to be a part of that change, right? Like, you know, you have this experience within the church and the years of ministry, and now you have this education and you're seeing all of the wounds. And so, you know, who better? in these regards than somebody that has both of, you know, both of that. Um, but it's scary. It's really scary to be sitting here with this information. I compared it to Esther and as she, you know, for such a, that she was created for this time, for such a time as this, but it w- it required tremendous bravery on her part as she approached the King, um, to plea for the lives of her people. I was actually, um, I had a dream one night and the next day this article was birthed, but I had a dream one night that I was standing in front of the congregation to where, where I really feel like my husband and I were born. Um, when we, when we chose as adults to really dedicate and commit our lives to Christ and to the ministry, I had a dream that I was standing in front of this church talking to the congregation about sex. And so very specific to, you know, that was my beginning that church was my beginning. And so I really felt like this is your start, you know, not necessarily that you should go to that exact church and, you know, talk about sex in that church, but um, I would if they, if they wanted me to, but that this is the beginning. This is that start here again. And so I woke up that uh, morning and I actually think it was the middle of the night. I got up and just started writing this article as kind of just this, the beginning, I feel like this is the beginning of, um, you know, what it, you know, being able to understand, you know, helping pastors and leaders within the church, um, to be able to understand more about these sexual struggles and issues and trauma and how they can be more helpful. So Mm, that's kind of how this article was birthed. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. And I I think, you know, I I see myself in the story of the church, you know, struggling to address and to handle and and, um, understand sexuality. Um, And I know that a lot of people do. I I think a majority of people in the church have questions about sex and sexuality that aren't being answered um, by the church. And so they're being answered elsewhere and sometimes not in good places, you know, and um, you talk about in your article, you know, God's the designer of sex, you know, if anyone should be talking about it and celebrating it, it should be his people, you know? And so I think that absolutely I see, you know, Esther in this, you know, as just taking that courageous first step of 
saying, Hey, we have a problem. Like people are being hurt because we're not talking about this. And, you know, you mention fear, um, being a, a reason that the church might be avoiding this conversation. What specifically would you say that they're afraid of? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that it is, it is a, a topic that hasn't been talked about. And so it's, are you going to be the first person? Are you going to be the, like, um, and it's that, you know, that fear of being misunderstood or being misportrayed or not having all of the information or, you know, Victoria, it could be that the leaders or the pastors, they're struggling themselves with, you know, sexual struggles or trauma or addiction or whatever. And so, because, you know, I know, um, from experience that just because you are leading a church does not mean that you are free of all of that, free of struggle, free of past experiences, you know, still being very relevant in your life that um, and I feel like there are a lot of people um, leading our church that would fall in this category of, you know, having sexual struggles. And so um, I think that that's, that's w- what I believe keeps the church silent. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think um, about it being too late? You know, do you think that it's beyond repair? You know, it's been, of course, just historically, this is the way that it's always been or felt like it's always been, you know, how do we repair this? Is it even possible to heal um, from this issue in the church? Yeah. I don't think, I think that uh, Jesus example to us and his you know, his gift of salvation tells us that, that we, it, it, nothing is beyond repair, right? Nothing Amen. is beyond, yeah. you know, um, redeeming and this is not either. And so I think that it just takes a first step and another step. And, um, you know, as I watch my couples be able to engage in a safe place with strong biblical foundation around issues around sexuality, I know it's not impossible, And so, because I am not apart from the church, when I'm sitting in my counseling sessions within my office or here online, like I am the church in that session right there. And so it's just, I'm just a small part of that. And so how can we broaden that and expand that, um, move that, you know, with into more people receiving therapy because the churches know where to send them and also the church um, educating themselves to where they can provide. Um, education and, you know, some answer some questions around, you know, some topics that might not need professional care or assistance in. And I, so I think it is just, you know, um, these are our next steps is just figuring out, you know, how to educate and how to grow in that understanding. Yeah. You mentioned a few steps in your article moving forward, you know, how to address this, how to repair it. Um, And one of the ones that you mentioned is educating yourself, um, educating ourselves as the church. So, I mean, what are some practical ways to do that? Yeah. Yeah. So pastors and leaders being able to reach out to, you know, people that are, that dedicate their life to, you know, knowing this and teaching this and understanding the sexual struggles with that biblical faith foundation. Um, Because there is a difference between secular sex therapy and Christian sex therapy. There's Mm -hmm. a big difference in that, in what you read even. Um, And so there, you know, leaders and pastors, you know, really educating themselves, knowing, knowing what resources as far as people or books or things like that. Um, Ministers and leaders doing their own work around Mm -hmm. um, sexual issues within their life. I think that um, from the, from that first beginning with Ron and I in ministry, my husband walked in on our pastor one Sunday morning, really, really early, um, as he was going to help prepare for a Sunday morning. And uh, our pastor walked out of the bathroom carrying the toilet brush, was going from one bathroom to the next bathroom. And my husband's like, sir, what are you doing? And he said, man, he said, if, if I can't clean the toilets, I have no business behind the pulpit. And that's just something that has really stuck with us as far as our leading throughout the years. If, how can we expect somebody in the church to do what we aren't willing to do ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, really just lead it pastors and leaders, um, you know, getting, getting the help that they might need 
around sexual struggles, whether it, you know, what, whether it be within their marriage or with addiction or, you know, whatever that might look like, I think that that will be a huge catalyst to change, you know, and that vulnerability and, you know, in leading, um, because much is required of our pastors and our leaders in that, in that regard. My husband and I saw you know, marriage therapy about 10 years in. And it is something that we very frequent from the pulpit. You know, Ron talks about it all the time that, you know, what I do and what we did and that, and, you know, his reservation of I'm the pastor, I give the therapy, I give the, you know, I give the counsel, I don't receive the counsel. Right. And that is unfortunately a lot of the, you know, um, the culture within the church that there, it, there's, it's not safe for pastors or leaders to, um, you know, be vulnerable around a struggle, right? And so just really opening up that safety for them to do their work, knowing where to go to do that so that they can then lead um, their church on where to go to do their work or help them provide that. And I think it's really important too that our pastors know where their limits are. So they recognize and you, and, you know, talking about boundaries with sexual trauma, you know, just mm -hmm. really recognizing that if you have somebody that comes to you, that makes themselves vulnerable to you, that discloses sexual trauma, just really recognizing your boundaries in that and like your limitations um, and knowing where to send them for help, knowing where mm -hmm. you can like take them to receive the kind of really um, specific care that they need to help through that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if there's, I mean, <laughs> of course there's not, there's not like a, a, a book on, you know, exactly what not to respond to or what <laughs> is too far or whatever, but, you know, would you just recommend, I mean, being discerning, you know, through prayer mm -hmm. in those moments, like, you know, what's your recommendation mm -hmm. as someone who works mm -hmm. in ministry? Yeah. Well, I mean, as a therapist um, within my profession, I consult often, you know, I might think I know what to do with, with a particular case or a particular issue, or I might think I might be in over my head, well, I'm reaching out. I'm reaching out to one of my colleagues, one of my coworkers, somebody within my field to say, hey, is this, you know, is this beyond me? Is this, or, you know, do I have this? And so I think with pastors, that's the same thing. You know, not being alone in that decision. You know, if you if this is something that you that you don't have a lot of experience in, or you know, you don't know a lot about, reach out, reach out to if you know to somebody, and you know, have, have that accountability there um, to just recognize that you know um, we do have our limits in that position. There are there are limitations that we have, and um, knowing who you know, having those resources in play, knowing who that we can um, refer to. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. That's good. I think the thing that struck me most about, um, your article, break the silence was just reading it and seeing myself in the story, seeing myself as, you know, a 14, 15 year old girl who felt very, um, unable to talk about this and, and nervous for what people might say or what people might mm -hmm. think, you know, people in leadership even. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure that a lot of people who read the article, you know, see themselves in that as well. So my last question would just be, what would you as both a counselor and a minister say to someone who has been wounded by the church in this way, um, you know, as they are working through their sexuality or their sexual issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important that, you know, we not make excuses or minimize the pain that they have, The you know, the you know, the wounds that you have, you know, they're very real to you. They're very real to, you know, um, the people that are sitting within the congregation still or aren't in church or, um, you know, come to uh, a therapist for help. You know, we're not going to make excuses or minimize that at all. We're going to very much recognize and understand that their experience was, um, was hard. It was, you know, it was difficult in that. Um, I think that, you know, them recognizing and understanding that, um, you know, that it can be, we, it can be healed and their relationship with the church doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to end there. Right. And I do think that um, it isn't out of vengefulness that the church doesn't talk about it, or I really do believe that it's out of fear. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, really being able to kind of talk through that and understand that and, um, so 
it's, it's really difficult as I sit with so many couples that, you know, received the message of don't do this, don't do that. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. And then when they get married, all of a sudden it's supposed to be right and they're supposed to crave it mm-hmm. or, you know, um, petition for it often. The, so there is, so recognizing there was a gap in that. There was a gap for you in that. The struggles that you were having, the, you know, the very, or you've, you, as a 14 year old, thought they were struggles, thought they were wrong, thought they were, you know, um, sinful, right? Uh, but in all actuality, they were perfectly natural and normal and mm-hmm. healthy and you just needed somebody to, to come alongside of you to help you steward those, to help you recognize and understand and value your sexuality and what God intended for it. And mm-hmm. so, so we get to do that now. So we can't take a big pink eraser and erase your experience or erase, you know, others' experiences in that. But we, we definitely can um, give them what they, uh, what would have been really valuable back then. We can give that to them now and really help to lean in and educate. And um, so, you know, I like to think that, um, yes, it was the church and the silence that hurt them. um, But when we grow, it can also be the church that heals them in that Mm -hmm. as we grow and learn um, to be able to be bold in these conversations. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. You know, I, I mean, I think of even just what you said earlier, you know, when you said, you know, there's always hope, there's always hope for healing and restoration. Um, As long as we can, you know, look back and see that Jesus still chose us and he still came and we still receive salvation. There is hope for the church to change the way that they approach these, these issues. And um, for people watching who maybe have been hurt to be healed um, and to experience um, something new and a new life in their church, you know? Um, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I would just love to see like this spark pastors, just the curiosity to reach out to me or other members of our team to, you know, to have, so I, cause I have in my mind, like I have my list of authors that I'm like, you can't read anything bad from these authors, these faith-based Christian authors around sexual pain and issues or, you know, discrep- desire discrepancy issues or sexual trauma issues or, you know, um, all of that. So, and they're all for, they're not just clinicians readings, they're for public consumption. And so, you know, to I would love to be able to share, you know, with pastors and leaders, these ref- these books, these references, um, be able to, you know, spend some time if they want me or somebody like me to come in and share and, you know, to hear what we have to say, whether it be to them or to their church. Right. Um, and uh, so I would just love to see conversation started you know, curiosity and, you know, churches really start to grapple with this. Can we do this? Can we, you know, can I, if, you know, as a pastor, if God lays up on your heart a message about sexuality, gosh, can I be bold enough to step into that and preach that? It's a big deal. Like, so I don't minimize that at all. That is a big deal, right? And so just kind of really opening um, ourselves as Christian therapists, as Christian sex therapists, to be able to provide that resource to them. So there is a lifeline, right? Yeah, that's, no, that's my hope. That's my hope for this article. Not that the church would feel shamed about this or blamed in this, but the church would be hopeful in this and that there is a way that we can redeem this. There is a way that we can, you know, I, I said this in my article that I really believe that there are more people within our church that struggle sexually than are, than are sexually healthy. I would say it's a three fourths that aren't sexually healthy and a fourth that are, if not, maybe even more. And just, you know, reading through the, the different issues, um, and that, and, you know, recognizing, you know, the betrayal and the pornography and, you know, the medications or the lifespan, because sex, because our, you know, sexual intimacy changes so much through the lifespan and it doesn't have to stop, but we do have to talk through it and change it. So there's just so much, you know, down to our teens and our singles and yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. the church has such a, we, we have so many people and we have such a platform of influence mm-hmm. that so many could be helped if 
through this, you know, through beginning conversations and pointing people in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for being brave and, and writing that article. And, you know, to people who are leaders in the church, people who have questions, there are resources um, and there are counselors here at My Counselor Online that want to sit down with you and, and tell you, um, you know, how we can sort of repair this and, and work through this together. Um, you're not, you know, alone trying to figure this out. Um, you know, education, you know, it doesn't have to be like a big burden for you. You know, we want to help and we want to provide resources for you, um, to ultimately heal your church and, and heal the people that are there. 